Hi students, welcome to the Baiju Sindhu News Analysis for 17th of August 2018. So let's get started. So let's look into the first article. So the first article is about ex-Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee. So yesterday we have had sad demise of ex-Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee. So let's look in detail as to what exactly are his contributions to the Indian administration. So Atal Bihari Vajpayee ji was known for his warmth and his inclusivity with respect to the human nature. All that is believed was people are supposed to be looked as humanitarian principles and these people have to be taken in an inclusive model. So he never cared about the caste, the creed, the sex, the religion, all these things were something set aside and what he believed was the fundamental principle of inclusivity. Majority of his life was actually spent in the opposition. So even when he became the prime minister, he carried with him the opposition together. So he was inclusive to the views of the opposition and at the same time the opposition also valued Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee. So let's try and understand with respect to his political career, with respect to what exactly he's done for the economy, how has he contributed in terms of the external sector and the security and what we will also contribute is in terms of the infrastructure. First let us see how it's his political journey. Let's unravel his political journey. So Vajpayee ji was born on December 25th, 1924 in Gwalior. So Vajpayee and his elder brother Prem were actually jailed in August during the Quit India movement. He was released after giving a return undertaking, expressing, declaring that he would not participate in the anti-British struggle. So he was not only a part of the Indian political journey post-independence, but he was also contributing to the pre-independence struggle. So even he had participated during the Quit India movement against the colonialism of the British. So in 1951, after India got the independence, he became a part of the Jansang. So he was elected to the Lok Sabha from Balrampur. That was the first time that he contested elections. So in 1968, after the death of Deen Dayal Upadhyay, Vajpayee became the national president of the Jansang. So in 1975, he was jailed along with several other opposition party leaders during the emergency. And during 1977, Vajpayee merged the Jansang into Janata Party. In 1977 to 1979, he served as the Ministry of External Affairs in Prime Minister of Moraji Desai's cabinet. He even visited China in a significant effort to normalize the ties as because we had seen that what exactly happened was during this particular period there was a lot of issues with respect to India and China's relationship. We had fought the 1962 war and China was all dominating with respect to the fundamentals with respect to the India and the Chinese relationship. In order to normalize this relationship it was the initiative of Vajpayee who actually went about as the external affairs minister, person who was wanting to make sure that there is peace and tranquility between India and China. So now that we have understood the basic aspect of how he initiated his journey into the political stream, what we also need to know is he served as a prime minister of India first for a term of about 13 days in 1996 and then for a period of about 11 months from the period 1998 to 1999 and then for a full term from 1999 to 2004. At the same time, what we need to know is that Vajpayee was also elected 10 times to the Lok Sabha from four different states. The first time was in 1957 from Balrampur and then twice as a member of Rajya Sabha. So this was his political journey from the year 1957 till 2004. So what exactly is its importance with respect to the economy? So when we look into what exactly happens and how exactly the growth rate was there, what we will realize is that he has contributed a lot to the Indian economy. So he took Indian economy to new heights by introducing a number of economic reforms under his tenure. One of the major impact was the growth rate of 8%. So this growth rate of 8% was sustained for a larger period of his administration and the inflation rate that was there was also kept under the check and even the foreign exchange reserves was also flourishing. And all this happened when India had a lot of troubles. Let's see what exactly happened. India had an earthquake in 2001 in Gujarat and then we had number of cyclones in the year 1999 and 2000. Then there was a horrific drought that happened in the year 2002 and 2003 and then there was oil crisis that happened in 2003 then there was Kargil that we fought in 1999 and then there was devastating parliament attack in 2001 in spite of all this what Vajpayee was able to do was he was able 
to make sure that the economy was stable and it was not fluctuating or volatile so in spite of all the troubles that we faced during that period of time 8% of GDP growth was something that needs to be saluted and that's why we remember this giant soul and next thing that we need to understand is with respect to the foreign and security policy so we know for the fact that India was always under threat with respect to the nuclear policy so what was happening is there were new two nuclear powers one on Pakistan and the other one was China so India had to take up an initiative and this initiative was the Pokhran 2 that happened in 1998 and this requires a lot of wit and commitment presence of a prime minister who could take on the tensions or the sanctions that came from the western countries so the major impact that we see with respect to the foreign policy with respect to the security is asking the government and the administration to go ahead with the nuclear program and then immediately what it followed was in we had to establish the peace process so we did initiate this particular nuclear program and now we have to initiate the peace process so what he did was he had a peacemaking deal with respect to Pakistan and he initiated a bus with respect to India and Pakistan then we had the Kargil and then we took on this particular movement and then what we were able to do is we were able to stop this particular Kargil with the support of other nations that is with the support of Israel as well as United States states of America and then what we see is a peace deal that happened after this particular Kargil when Pervez Musharraf actually came down to India in January 2004 so from all these things from 1998 nuclear testing to free bus in Lahore to 1999 and then the Kargil that happened a couple of months later and then what we see is a peace deal that happened within Pervez Musharraf and actually watch pay administration all this says that when it comes to the national security he was ready to take on the risk and at the same time when it was serving the humanity when it has to serve the moral perspex where India believes in the principle of Shanti so what he did was he wanted to lay a humanitarian perspective and he established the priest credentials between all these countries and at the same time when it comes to the infrastructure he was one of those persons who always believed that in case India had to develop infrastructure infrastructure was one of the core and the backbone of the economy so what he did was he made sure that the infrastructure was actually developing at a much larger scale than what happened in the previous administration and one of the most important plans was with respect to the golden quadrilateral so the golden quadrilateral actually connected the north south east west with respect to India this golden quadrilateral which was actually planned up with respect to north south east west connecting all the zones the Chennai the Kolkata the Delhi and Mumbai through a network of highways which was connecting actually the urban sectors so you need something for the village sector for this what the Prime Minister actually came up was the Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana. So this program of Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana was actually connecting all the distant villages across the country with the network of all weather roads. So this is what we need to consider with respect to the infrastructure. So apart from this let's try and see what are some of the beautiful gems that have been said by Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee. So in this one of the speeches he said my message to the Chief Minister is that he should follow Raj Dharma. A ruler should not make any discrimination between between his subjects on the basis of caste, creed and religion. So as we have discussed what he believed was in an inclusive model which is something above all this that is the caste, the sex, the religion and all these parameters have to be set aside. So in case a nation has to move ahead what we need is a Raja Dharma which is based on righteousness, which is based on truth, which is based on values and these values have to be taken by any chief minister. It is not the religion will take the precedence but it is the righteousness that takes the president and not the other way around and it further goes on to say poverty is multi-dimensional it extends beyond money incomes to the education healthcare skills enhancement political participation at all levels from the local to the global access to natural resources clean water air and advancement of one's own culture and social organization so we would be able to make out that he had an empathy and compassion towards all the lower rank of the people so he also believed 
their poverty is multidimensional. It's not only about the economic value or about money. It is about making sure that we are providing them all the other things like the health, the education, the skill, the political participation. Only after providing them all these dimensions with respect to poverty, that is when we would be able to lift them with respect to the empowerment. And at the same time, he has always said that we in India are inheritance to a greater civilization whose life chant has become Shanti, that is the peace and Baichara, which means the brotherhood. India has never been an aggressive nation, a colonizer or a hegemony in her long history. In modern times, we are alive to the responsibility to contribute to peace friendship and cooperation both in our region and then around the world. So he carried forward one of the India's major philosophy that India believes in Vasudeva Kutumbakam. So we are a family. We are not here as an aggressor and India for long has never continued as an aggressor. All that India believes in the pieces of peace and tranquility. So we want to take the world towards the maturity and we want to take the world towards the global peace and India wants to be an initiator of peace. That's why we believe in the principle of Shanti which is peace and we are never the aggressor and he says gun can never solve the problem brotherhood can issues can be resolved if we move forward guided by three principles of insaniyat that is humanity and jamhuriyat that is democracy and Kashmiriyat that is Kashmiri's age-old legacy of amity so what he's speaking about is with respect to the Kashmir's problem so Kashmir problem is always hindered the growth of that region so what he specified here is in case we will have to develop as a particular region what we need is democracy without democracy we would not be able to carry forward usually when we see how exactly the transmission of power is happened during the earlier times there is always bloodshed that has happened when it is transfer of power from one king or to another region and democracy is the only one where there is peaceful transition of power so what we as a region should develop in Kashmir is that we need democracy simply because it will stop all the bloodshed and there is peaceful transition transmission of power from one party to another. So we as a Kashmir people, in case we have to develop, what we need is democracy. And this democracy will sustain the model of humanity. When there is bloodshed, it does not result in humanity. But when there is democracy, there is humanity. And when there is no bloodshed, again, it serves the purpose of humanity. So what we need is democracy, which has its chain link to humanity. And when we have to support this particular region of Kashmir, when we'll have to move towards the developmental model, what we need is democracy and then this will carry the values of humanity and this will bring about the fortunes of Kashmir. So when we have these chains interconnected, then Kashmir will grow with all other regions of India. So be a part of this inclusive model is what Vajpayee had actually said with respect to the Kashmir issue. And he also said one cannot wish away the fact that before good neighbors can truly fraternize with each other, they must first mend their fences. This was with respect to Pakistan as well as Kashmir and then with respect to the Pokhran he said that Pokhran 2 nuclear tests were conducted for not for self glorification nor as a display of nationalism but this has been our policy and I think it is for the minimum deterrence what we should be having is a credible deterrence that is why we took the decision to conduct tests so with look at the immense maturity when he's speaking about all these important issues. So what he says in this particular case is that whatever nuclear test that we conducted was not to showcase the hegemony of India. We are not here to showcase our jingoism. We are not here to showcase our shawnism. We are here only as a deterrent purposes. We are not showcasing the world. Yes, we are something we are going to rule the world. All that we are saying is that we are using this particular nuclear deterrence protocol only to make sure that the enemy nation does not take India lightly. So we are not going to dominate. This is not a hegemonic thing, but it is only to make sure that some other country does not take India lightly. That is why we have taken this particular initiative. So what we need to understand overall is that he had a firm belief system. He had the humor. He had the poise. He had the tolerance. He had the large heartedness to carry people wherever he went about. And this is what makes him as a greatest statesperson that ever was given. So that is why he 
was always given and considered the greatest principal soul and he was also given the Bharat Ratna. So what we need to understand from his, he always evoked the beautiful meanings of balancing two ideas of India. One is the Nehruvian legacy that he carried along with him and at the same time as a Hindu nationalist, he also weighed both these together rather than only appeasing certain section of the people. So moving on, let's look into the next article. So the next article says no creamy layer knob for SEST. So when we look into the context, what it clearly says is, is that there is the creamy layer concept for the OBC and the same creamy layer concept that the OBC has will not be implemented for the SEST. So now let's try and understand is SEST people creamy layer necessary or is it not necessary? First thing that we will understand is, is creamy layer necessary? Yes, creamy layer is also necessary for the SEST. So let's try and look at some of the arguments as to why it is necessary to also bring up a creamy layer with respect to the SEST section or this SEST community. One of the basic idea is when we say SEST, it does not have a particular caste. It also includes a number of other caste. But what has happened with the number of years and experiences, there are certain subcasts within the SEST who have actually taken majority of the benefits. So it is these people who are actually claiming the quotas within the SEST domain and they are extracting all the mileage with respect to the SEST reservation. So what is being thought of is because it is only a small group of people who are actually benefited from this particular policy, why have the particular policy. So instead, what we need to do is we need to bring up this particular creamy layer. Why? Because it is only this particular subcast which has been taking the particular reservation over a long period of time. So if these people who are actually settled and if these people's wealth status has actually improvised over a period of time, why provide them the reservation is one of the arguments. So in order to make sure that these people who are wealthy, these people who have the economical status and they have stabilized their whole diamond dimensions of their life needs to be taken out so that other people who do not have all the stability and the economic provisions and the empowerment needs to be given these provisions. So there is certain section and these section have to be omitted from the CST Act. That is, they need to come under the creamy layer provision because they have already taken all the benefits that is required for them to stabilize their life is one of the arguments. And at the same time, when we look into the statistics side, right, the one of the statistics according to the Price All India Income and Expenditure Survey, what it says is around 6% of the SC households, that's accounting to about 4 million households, earn between 5 to 10 lakh a year and 7%, that is about 5 million, actually earn over 10 lakh. In the case of ST households, 11%, that is 3 million, earn between 5 and 10 lakh and 5%, that is 1 million, earn over 10 lakh. So when we are seeing all these people, what we realize is that there are certain people and they have a very good economical consideration and at the same time when you look into the statistics with respect to the central government OBCs who earn more than 8 lakh are considered to be the creamy layer recently according to a notification based on the price survey if 22 million households are creamy layer with respect to the OBCs 13 million SESTs are also creamy layer when the OBCs are considered the, as a creamy layer, even these people that is ACST will also have to be considered as creamy layer because these people are already evolved. These people have the economic stability. When OBC has that creamy layer concept, why not get the same thing to these people is one of the arguments. When 22 million OBC people are actually called as OBC that is in the creamy layer when they are not able to derive the benefits why is that these people that is 13 million should derive the benefits in case these people are deriving the benefits it means that other people who are supposed to get these derivations or these economical benefits will not derive the same thing at the same time it says if a rich OBC is seen as someone who should no longer be eligible for the same reservations available to a poor OBC same logic should apply to the SEST is the argument so when we look in to the statistics. The statistics again says all these things, right? What it has also said is that Lakur committee was actually appointed to look into this particular issue. And what Lakur committee has also said is that it has said that there are certain socially and advanced SESTs and these people have to be kept outside the policy. So the Lakur committee has also recommended the committee which has actually appointed to look into all the statistics. This has also recommended and because the number of people within that particular committee 
committee the subcast within the scst majority of people who are claiming this reservation are only from a particular subcast so these people in case they have a economic stability these people should be lifted off this particular provision and then there needs to be a creamy layer concept is what this arguments with respect to the creamy layer is and at the same time what we also need to understand is creamy layer should not be adapted to the scsts why let us try to understand this so there was one of the particular committee report and this particular committee report was actually headed by thorat so what exactly happened was thorat actually headed this particular committee and they went about a research in the area of delhi so what exactly happens in here is there were certain people who are let's say for example all the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes in case they had to take a rent a particular home they were asked for their caste names so in case they were from a particular community belonging to sc and st they were not given house for rent so what is happening is there is social discrimination that is happening so what this committee that was appointed to look at us decided was there is a lot of social discrimination with respect to the sc sts that are happening even for renting a house the caste name becomes a very important prerogative when it comes to certain regions and certain people who actually started associating caste with actually renting the house so is it not something inferior is it not something discriminatory is it not something which is against the fundamentals of the constitution and because it is violating all these principles that is why we should make sure that there is this provision of creamy layer not included in the constitution well let me discuss once again what exactly happens so in case there are these people who are time and again asked what exactly is his caste and even for renting house what they actually feel is they feel isolated within the society and because they are actually isolated finding houses or even renting a house becomes a costly affair so this is not going to be the same for the obcs the obcs are comparatively on an advantageous part let's say for example the gaudas in the karnataka the godiyar in the tamil nadu these people are also the obcs but they are never discriminated when they go outside but what is happened with respect to scst is these people are discriminated time and again as we discussed recently with respect to nagraj case as well when there were people who are actually daunting their mustache the handlebar mustaches or even in fact the riding of the horses they were actually stripped off and even belted and caned so is this what we actually see in the society so because we see all these type of social discrimination the concept of creamy layer should not be enforced why because the obc do not face all these types of discrimination but the ses still face the kind of discrimination which is against the fundamentals of the constitution so because it is fundamental mentally wrong with respect to the constitution the creamy layer concept should not be included with respect to the scst and what it is also serving is let's say for example there is a person who is actually is wealthy enough within the scst domain he happens to go on and become further wealthy and wealthy but the number of people within the scst community the vertical movement of this particular wealth is not happening so what happens in this particular case is people actually get connected with this person let's say for example example there is a person let's say ambedkar dr b r ambedkar so ambedkar struggled to a lot he actually went through a lot of pain and he in fact went about and said that there has to be an annihilation of the caste so he was one person who was actually segregated but still he moved up to the ladder but even now what certain community people from the scst community is they look up to ambedkar they want to envision the life as how he actually was and how he moved up to the ladders of the life so what happens is when there is a person, person who has actually become wealthy with time what happens is these people who are not wealthy who have not got that provision to move up their ladder look up to that particular person and they say that they would want to accomplish so in case there is this provision of creamy layer what it will happen is there is no vertical perforation that happens so instead all these people will not have the real time heroes they will not actually have all their heroes whom they would want to wish to see in the future so they gain the creamy layer concept should not be in initiated to the scst it what goes on to say and at the same time what we need to understand is this reservation that is actually provided it is something to do with the anti discrimination program so it is not a poverty elevation program so we have seen how 
exactly the discrimination is happening in the society in spite of 70 years of independence that we have got we still have untouchability in the country we still see them parading naked we still see that certain people from the higher class actually poison the water just because a lower caste person should not be drinking water from the well so when these things are continuing in the society why is that the creamy layer thing should come up is what is the sum of the arguments that we need to consider so what you need to consider is the Torrid committee report especially when it comes to renting the houses there has been a lot of discrimination so when there is discrimination and when this discrimination has to be sorted out what we need is the creamy layer should not be enforced why because there is a lot of social problems and this social problems can be addressed only when there is the concept of reservation and this reservation should not have any creamy layer you cannot compare the OBC and the SESTs because the SESTs are people who are discriminated but the OBCs are not the people who are discriminated so the OBCs are rich landlords in certain areas in few regions let's say for example the Marathas who are wanting to ask the reservations they are comparatively on the smarter edge but at the same time the SESTs have been pushed lower and lower in time and again and this is why the creamy layer concept should not be introduced so what exactly is the conclusion so even in case you want to actually come up with this particular creamy layer what the government should do is it should actually conduct a survey so there are number of subcasts within the ACST so those subcasts which are actually well settled who have economic stability they have all types of economical background and they're able to support the even the social discrimination only those people should be carved out and these people should be coming under the bracket of the creamy layer but rest of the people majority of them who have still not sustained them in life these people should still be uh, provided the SCST Act and these people should still be provided the reservation and at the same time what we also need to do is there are number of religious gurus and leaders what these people should actually do is these people should be the propagators of peace and bonhomi they should establish bonhomi and camaraderie with respect to all these people so all the peace and tranquility is established within the domains of the people so what we need to understand as a whole is that there are fair bit of arguments with respect to the SCST Act that is the creamy layer has to come up and at the same time there are fair bit of an arguments with respect to why SCST Act should not have the creamy layer but only the Supreme Court as well as the government will be able to decide whether this should be there or not so moving ahead let's look into the next article so the next article is important from the prelims perspective so what we will be discussing in detail is about the Bittakarnika Park so what is important here is it is a national park which is located in Kendrapara district of Odisha so one of the major important points from the prelims perspective is it is located in Odisha so the national park is surrounded by the Karnika Wildlife Sanctuary, Gahirmata Beach and Marine Sanctuary lies to the east and separate swamp region over the canopy of mangroves from the Bay of Bengal. Thus it is in the vicinity of rich biodiversity. The park is home to saltwater crocodile. They have asked in number of prelims in the fact. So kindly remember this. So the white crocodile, Indian python, king cobra, black ibis, darters and many other species of flora and fauna. The National Park and Wildlife Sanctuary is inundated by the rivers of Brahmani, Baitrani, Dambra as well as Patsala. So this Kalibanjia island spread over 8.5 square kilometer a place in Bittakarnika has attracted the attention of foreign scientists as it possesses 70% of the total mangrove species of the world. So kindly remember this fact where exactly is Kalibanjia located? It is located in the forest of Bittakarnika Park. So this is all we will have to know from this article. So moving on, let's look into the next article. So the next article says NPCI unveils more secure UPI with overdraft facility. So what exactly are we speaking about? So we'll be discussing about the UPI too. So what exactly is con context here? There was an upgraded version of the universe United Payments Interface that was actually launched by Urijit Patel. So what exactly is the UPI? That's the first question that pops up. So basically UPI is nothing but one of the real-time payment systems that was actually developed by National Payments of Corporation of India. So this can be a potential question in your prelims. So kindly remember who developed this. It is the NPCI that is the National Payments Corporation of India. So this interface of UPI is actually regulated by RBI. So who exactly regulates them it is the RBI so it is actually done by 
in PCI but the control mechanism is under the RBI so what we need to understand is it is nothing but the real-time payment system so you have a particular platform let's say for example the beam so all the bank accounts will be linked to this so you'll be able to channelize your send money from one bank account to another without even requiring the IFSC or for the example the account number and so on so you will have a UPI ID just because you have a UPI ID you will be able to transact the transactions with respect to one person to another without having all the account details with respect to the UPI. So what exactly has happened with respect to this is there has been some important updates that has been added and that is the upgradation of UPI 1 to UPI 2. So let's try and understand what exactly these things are. One of the first things that we need to understand with respect to this article is first is the linking of the overdraft. So what exactly happened in the UPI earlier model is that is the one first model is that they did not have any provisions to link the overdraft account it was only to do with the savings account so in case you had to link your UPI account it was only restricted to the savings account and there was no provision of linking the overdraft account to your UPI ID so what is being provided in this particular case is that the customers now will be able to transact instantly that is even in case they don't have a amount in their balance sheets in case they don't have a relevant deposit within their safe savings account they'll still be able to have the transaction with the linking of the overdraft the overdraft which was not there in UPI 1 has been provided in UPI 2 so he'll be able to transact even without the amount that is laid in this savings account and next important thing that is there with respect to this is the one-time mandate so what do we mean by it let's say for example there is a particular commitment between you and Flipkart so you actually enter into an agreement that you say that you would actually want to buy this particular product and it goes on an EMI basis so what you're doing is you're promising Flipkart that you're paying EMI on a monthly basis so you are you have taken a particular product and the product is with you but you also promise the Amazon or Flipkart that you will be playing with this particular products EMI on a monthly basis that is on first so what you are doing in this particular case is it can be used in cases where the money is actually transferred while you have already committed to a particular cost even before so on the first of every month there is this particular cost that you will have to pay so Amazon or Flipkart will be able to take away money on this particular date until you pay the EMIs for that particular product so what you would be able to to do is you would be able to enhance this functionality this was not there on the earlier UPIs but what you have right now is you would be able to enter into a commitment and you would have taken a particular product and then on the initiation of this agreement there would be particular amount that will be detected on a predetermined agreement that you enter with respect to the merchant and the third thing that we would be able to understand with respect to the feature is invoice facility let's say for example you do not actually trust one of the persons or that particular market person so what you initiate in this particular process is that you would ask him for request for an invoice so he would be able to usually what exactly happens is the invoice is sent after a particular product is delivered but you want to know whether that particular merchant is actually on a safe ploy or not so what you do in this case is you request the merchant to send the invoice much prior than what is happening right now so the merchant or the market person actually sends the invoice so you'll be able to check for the authenticity of this particular product so you would be able to check whether the product is real fake real truth or anything and then in case you feel only the product is truth that is after that merchant or the market person has actually sent the invoice you would be able to particularly book this particular product so this invoice was not there in the earlier product but now what you have is that the customers would be able to actually check this particular invoice sent by the merchant prior to actually making this particular payment and the next thing that we would be also able to understand is there will be sign intent and QR so with respect to this what was happening is there were certain provisions where the QR could have actually been changed so what you would be able to do is you'll be able to check the authenticity of the merchants while actually scanning the QR or the quick response code in this particular case so what exactly is the significance so when we look into the significance what exactly we realize is the transactions are were faster and it will become much faster it will be much safer because we could be able to check the authenticity we would be able to check the authenticity of the QR code and at the same time in case there is tempering then the receiver that is we who are actually going to receive a particular product we will be notified the same so it 
it is much safer so major two significance are the faster and the safer transaction so moving on let's look into the next article so the next article is to do with scientists to test land for lego so we have discussed this n number of times so what we will be discussing in detail is with respect to the prelims facts so let's try and understand what exactly it is so when we look into the context it says the government of india has given in principle approval for the construction and operation of the laser inferometer gravitational wave laboratory india that is the lego which is here and then what this will do it will set up this gravitational wave observatory in the sites of hingoli district in maharashtra so this is the key important point from the prelims perspective so where exactly is it going to establish it will be established in the hingoli district of maharashtra so let's try and understand what exactly is this project all about so what it says is that the lego project operates on three gravitational wave detectors two are at hanford in the state of washington northwestern usa and one is at livingston in louisiana so the southeastern usa and currently these observatories are being upgraded to their advanced configurations so what we need to understand from the fact is that the proposed lego india project aims to move one advanced lego detector from hanford to india and this lego india project is an international collaboration between the lego laboratory and three indian institutions that is the lego india consortium which includes the institute of plasma research and then we have the raja ramana center for advanced research and then the iucaa pune so all these are in collaboration to make sure that this project becomes a successful one and the lego lab would provide the complete design and also the key detector components to indian scientists would provide the infrastructure to install the detector and it would also be operated by lego india as well as lego tab so this project is piloted by department of atomic energy as well as department of science and technology which is reportedly to cost 1200 crores and is expected to be ready by 2025 so these are all the facts that we will have to know so apart from this what exactly is the significant aspect so when we look into the significant aspect what we realize is we will have to look at it from three dimensions one is from the dimensions of this particular project the other one from the industry side the third one is with respect to the public outreach and the educational perspective so when we look into what exactly the significance of this particular project is what it will do is it will provide opportunities to large number of scientists and engineers so because we have this particular project initiated in india what it will do is it will provide opportunities for the scientists as well as to engineers to work on all the dimensions of the gravitational wave and india would be able to take global readership in the astronomical frontier so the first point that we need to understand is it will provide and envision the india as a leader across the world and this will also help all the scientists as well as the engineer so they'll be able to get the first hand experience of how exactly the gravitational wave actually works apart from this what we will have is the industrial part so because we have the scientists and the engineers we also need the equipments and for this equipment manufacturing what we need is the industry so what will happen is because we need all the components the industry is also developed so industries and all the logistics that is associated with this this industry will also develop accordingly and what we would be able to develop is the contacts so because we are actually developing something which is not there in and around what we will be able to develop is the contacts in and around the world so basically what we are doing is we are developing a global network of gravitational wave detectors and the scientists and the engineers so all the contacts that we have will be established and at the same time what we this will also do is this will actually help in understanding the other segments let's say for example this will also require the development of optics or the lasers or physics astronomy astrophysics cosmology and then you have the computational science mathematics so it will help us understand the other dimensions of the sectors so this is not only a single sector right so it requires the number of other sectors and it's linked to the other dimensions of the sector what we will also have to understand is that this will provide a number of large number of 
talented and motivated young researchers and students to the program so this will automatically feed into the scientists as well as the engineer cycle so this is all we will have to understand from this article so moving on let's look into the next awareness so it says rupee slides to a new low versus dollar on page one mumbai gives india its first baby penguin why turkey's crisis feels familiar for emerging markets india's oil import bill to jump by 26 billion steel imports from japan south korea surge so these three articles we have already discussed in yesterday's classes and in today uh, the steel imports from japan and south korea we have already discussed something to do with the trade war the video is also uploaded on the youtube so kindly check those videos so this is it for today kindly visit the baiju cna look into the prelims as well as pra mains practice questions write all your answers on the comment section we will evaluate and give you the relevant feedback for the same thank you so much all the best